in a little different uh, flavor of a webinar from Polytech. Um, not the usual uh, stuff about uh, some, you know, decades old applications or um, no, no talk about products this time around. Um, I put some pictures to kind of hint you into what you're going to see. In case some of you check out right after the first slide, I wanted to make sure there is something uh, you know you you uh, you know that yeah even if you all you get is like elephants and vibrometry wow so yeah that's that's uh, also good enough for us but we'll go through some of these applications and as we go you'll um, kind of recall and uh, relate to some of these pictures and these are definitely not to scale. Um, a dinosaur is much larger than uh, this little insect called a tree hopper. So uh, with that little background, let's go through the outline first. And again, uh, as I jump from one application to another, just because of the, you know, the, the, the type of webinar this is, there's going to be no rhyme or reason between two applications. So you're going to see jumping around, but so you'll have to kind of switch gears, you know, kind of fast. Um, just because the, the one application, there is no, um, you know, smooth way to transition from one to another. So starting with some um, EV, you know, electric vehicles, we are seeing a lot of applications there. Again, not too out of the way, but still non-standard. You know, haptics is a big field in all kinds of uh, research fields. I'll lay out some of those. Uh, meta materials uh, is another big one uh, that goes hand in hand with additive manufacturing as well. Uh, one of my favorites and uh, close to my heart is the ear mechanics. What is vibrometry doing, uh, playing around in uh, inner ear, middle ear, uh, all that stuff. Insect and animal communication is a big one as well. Again, not very well known, uh, certainly falls under the exotic category. Uh, very high cycle fatigue will fall more under interesting and uh, we'll end with a bang uh, talking about uh, an AFM that uses a vibrometer uh, for uh, the beam deflection measurements. So with that little background, um, yeah, and as I said, you know, this is hopefully part one of many parts. There are so many applications that we can talk about that don't fall under the, you know, the, 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 the common mold, I guess. Um, and uh, keep your feedback coming. If you if you have any applications you would like to hear about, please uh, let us know. We'll be able to, you know, happy to kind of incorporate it in uh, in future webinars. Now I say EV, but you know I had a picture of a dinosaur on the front slide, so I got to start with dinosaurs. Uh, this was um, uh, a T Rex uh, skeleton, I guess, and uh, this was at the Chicago. A museum of natural history that we did this measurement it was uh, very interesting um, the goal for the measurement was to um, see what happens to these specimens in the museum when um, there is some external sound or vibration source so for example if there's some construction going on outside what is it doing? What kind of vibrations are these uh, bones feeling, for example? Or let's say there is a concert, which is fairly, you know, that it, it, it you know, many museums host these, uh, you know, these gala events and music concerts. And uh, so, what is that doing to, uh, you know, this this dinosaur skeleton? Or we have also done studies with uh, some consultants that um, about paintings. What is it doing to the paintings, for example? So here you can see the the B and let me also change my pointer so it's easier. So yeah, you can see the, um, the laser beam where we were shooting uh, and the excitation was um, provided using a speaker. Uh, we used two different types of vibrometers here, um, a single point helium neon based and also a scanning vibrometer that was infrared. Um, again, a closer uh, look at uh, the two laser beams. So this was, again, we don't want to get into detail. The goal of this presentation is to kind of just give you a quick sort of flavor of it. And if something sounds interesting, reach out, we'll uh, get you more uh, details. So that's dinosaurs. Now, as I said, we're going to jump from uh, some crazy opposite topics. Uh, so let's talk about electric vehicles. The graph uh, kind of tells the story about, you know, the sales of um, EVs um, last, uh, you know, 
12 years or so now. Um, what was uh, very interesting to me was, uh, you know, that the sales doubled from 2020 to 2021 and tripled from 2021 to 2022. And the, it's it's all kinds of, um, you know, vehicles when we talk about EV and all kinds of batteries as well. It could be a plug-in hybrid or, you know, just battery only or a hybrid like a, a Prius, for example. Uh, and the, you know, the, the, the battery electric vehicles, which is BEV also, incorporates or kind of includes not just cars you know you're talking boats and bikes and forklifts and you know energy storage and all kinds of different things as well so you know battery in a, in general is a, is, is a huge uh, field and it comes with its own challenges when we talk about comparing a battery electric vehicle with an internal combustion engine so ICE based uh, car, for example, so the 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 dominant noise sources are very different. You know, when we talk about the ICE or the internal combustion engine, you know, the the the, the powertrain noise noise is is a is a good chunk of the pie. Whereas when we talk about the electric vehicles, you know, um, the the road noise, the wind noise, and also some of the other tiny noises that were never heard before because they were getting masked now become more amplified more prominent mm -hmm. so that's just you know something to keep in mind you know and the common vibration sources you know suspension systems and tire wind and electric drive uh, so so uh, you know new class of vehicles comes with a lot of benefits but a new set of challenges as well when it comes to structural acoustics vibrations mm -hmm. so how is vibrometer coming into picture in this? Um, let's see if my mouse cooperates. Yeah. So here, you know, when we um, look at the applications we have come across in the in the EV side of things, of course, there's a classic, you know, calibrating the FE model type applications, but also, you know, the at, at battery pack and module le level, you know, modal analysis, you know, random vibration tests fatigue analysis, also simulating transport conditions or so doing some kind of random or um, uh, road noise, you know, kind of, you know, recording the road vibrations and then simulating that on a shaker. Um, we also done uh, or getting into more and more of NDT, you know, non-destructive testing of the battery packs. So in the next three slides, I have like three examples to give you a better feel uh, for, you know, just some representative examples. So this is a paper where, um, you know, the main um, goal was to, you know, kind of evaluate what the welding parameters should be when they put together a battery uh, for the best joint quality, because that, you know, the joints get broken, you know, it affects the efficiency and the, uh, you know, the overall uh, life of a battery. So the vibrometer measurements in this case were done on the anvil and the horn. So the horn is here, the anvil, and then kind of see what is the relation. Is everything moving in phase? What kind of power is ideal for a good, reliable, you know, joint quality? What kind of amplitude should be used? What kind of frequencies should be used? So these are all the parametric studies that were done using a vibrometer. This is a high frequency measurement. So, and also very um, space constrained. So this was an ideal application for uh, vibrometers. So this is example one. Example two, this is work uh, done at UT Austin. Uh, they are, um, um, and they presented some of this work at the International Model Analysis Conference this year, uh, Professor Mike Haberman's group. And here the goal was to take a, a, a module and then um, uh, determine the SOC, which is the state of charge, and then also defect detection on these lithium ion batteries. And their approach was uh, more on uh, evaluating vibrometry or vibrometers as a diagnostic tool. Can we see a change in the natural frequency uh, depending on the amount of charge that is in a, in a cell or in a battery. And then what about the temperature? So do we see a change in the natural frequency? And as many of you would guess, yes, uh, they did. Uh, they were able to correlate, you know, pending further studies, of course, but they definitely saw a change in the natural frequency, depending on whether the battery was 25%, 50%, 75% charged. So again, you know, the goal is to be able to 
extend the life of the batteries, uh, do preventative maintenance, come up with strategies to be able to determine when is a good, you know, what's a good time to charge, how much to charge, you know, and the temperature conditions uh, associated with it. So that was uh, also very interesting. The last study on, uh, or, or in the slide on batteries is a very traditional modal analysis. Again, pretty much done for all kinds of vehicles and all kinds of components. But in this case, I just wanted to show you an example of a stator uh, of the electric car motor. And this is a traditional modal analysis where there's an external excitation. In this case, we are using a modal hammer and then automated model hammer. And you can see the setup here with the, what we call our robo web. It's a three-dimensional scanning vibrometer system mounted on a robot, uh, goes around and scans the whole surface. And then if you have an FE model, now you can do some cross correlation. You can do visual correlation. You can do MAC analysis. You can do all kinds of things. Uh, just as a sense of comparison, on the left, what you are seeing is uh, done with a few accelerometers. So you can see that, yeah, you can kind of see the shape, but definitely it's more like a stick figure. So uh, when you're comparing it with a simulation, there's a lot uh, that is, uh, you know, imagination as compared to what you see on the right is a lot more data uh, with a higher, much, much, much higher spatial resolution. So the comparison and the correlation becomes much more um, accurate and uh, easy. Uh, so that was the goal of this um, FE correlation. So from dinosaurs to EVs to let's talk haptics now next. Um, it's good to define haptics first because it's a very new, I mean, relatively new modality uh, in terms of uh, communication, a, a, a mode of communication between you know humans and machines, I guess. The way Wikipedia defines it, any technology that can create a sense of touch by application forces, vibrations, or motion. So even if you don't know, most of you have felt haptic feedback, whether it's a notification through your smart watch or your smartphone um, or you know some other um, means, basically some kind of vibration-based feedback to give you some information. Uh, a lot of these vibration-based feedback happens uh, with a transducer that's built inside the device. And these are either linear resonant actuators or now more and more uh, piezo actuators, which are more energy efficient as compared to LRAs. LRAs are still more cost efficient, so that's always a balance between the two. Some applications or examples where haptics is in action, and boy, this was very interesting for me to learn as well as I was researching this particular slide. You know, phones, wearables, computers, you know, you see, uh, haptic feedback uh, track pads now, you know, the, the VR, AR, you know, consoles and headphones too. I mean, uh, this company Razer, they make these uh, haptic feedback headphones, shoes, uh, very interesting. Uh, robot assisted, uh, you know, surgery, so remote surgery where the, the surgeon is sitting somewhere and the, the robots are doing. And so the surgeon is getting all kinds of haptic feedback based on the force inputs coming from the probes uh, uh, at the patient uh, location. And the surgeon is getting that feel of, of touch and uh, pressure as, as he or she is doing the surgery. And of course, there's also, um, I think this is an Audi e-tron, there's a uh, haptic feedback and all kinds of uh, feedback, uh, vibration-based feedback coming from the steering wheel and the knobs. This is one of my favorites of uh, assistive uh, technologies is what it kind of falls under. Um, this particular company does um, you know, ultrasound based uh, braille. Uh, so it's like non touch, but it's kind of opens up uh, a lot of doors for um, a lot of people there. So fascinating technology, uh, but you can see the commonality between this and vibrometers. Vibrometers measure movement. So that's where we come into picture. So again, not too many examples. Here's one from. Um, uh, Professor uh, Jenna Gorlevis at uh, St. Louis University, and uh, yeah, her group was studying, you know, how the vi vibration patterns, you know, propagate on different hardware devices. So she did some comparison between a tablet, iPhone, a Moto G. So uh, again, to see how the wave propagates, and she's also working on a lot of these um, uh, 
um, assistive technology type platforms uh, for her research. Um, so yeah, that's the, the haptic uh, feedback um, side of things. Um, now let's move to another very interesting and emerging uh, application, uh, metamaterials. So for the uninitiated, I think it's good to define uh, metamaterials first. So these are engineered materials, so designed, made, not available in nature. Uh, engineered materials designed with certain properties in mind. So generally speaking, they would have very complex structures because of the way they are designed for certain wave propagation characteristics. Some of the applications could be, you know, one of the most common is like a bandpass filter, a band gap filter, optical cloaking. So if you want to avoid certain uh, wavelengths of light uh, coming in or going out uh, based on the material uh, wave propagation characteristics, uh, directional thermal dissipation, negative index of refraction. So these are just some examples where uh, uh, metamaterials are used. And you know the, the the concept has been around for a long, long time. But I think the enabling technology for metamaterials has been 3D printing or additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing gives this ability to create these super complex uh, shapes that are extremely tunable. So, uh, but again, with this complex geometry, is also uh, it, it, it doesn't fall under you know the common isotropic material characterization curve, right? So it's challenging or impossible to test these with any kind of contact or conventional transducers. This is where, again, vibrometers play a very important role in being able to exactly see what are the wave propagation characteristics of these uh, materials. So uh, here's just a very small example on a, on a Meta material that's a cube here, very complex geometry. This is an inter interesting application because we had to stitch the data, but not only that, um, in this case, we were shooting um, directly and also through a mirror and then stitching the data between those two. So this is another topic we'll cover in a future webinar, measuring through mirrors and uh, other uh, media. But uh, yeah, in the case of metamaterials, uh, wave propagation patterns, material properties, you know, calibrating the numerical model, uh, optimizing the 3D printing process. You know, there's a group at Los Alamos, they've published a bunch of work on this. They do quite a bit of this to be able to test and uh, determine the material properties and uh, uh, layer by layer. Uh, and these um, applications generally span a few kilohertz to several uh, megahertz. So. This is just a tip of the iceberg. There's just so much happening in this particular application and so many different researchers working on so many different things. It's like um, what chat GPT is doing in, in some ways uh, in, the, in the other world. Uh, one of my favorite applications, um, uh, ear mechanics or hearing or hear, hearing mechanics, um, just to kind of put some numbers in place, you know, hearing loss, According to World Health Organization, you know, 2.5 billion people are projected to have some sort of hearing loss by 2050. Uh, I mean, the numbers are just staggering. You know, 1.1 billion are at a risk of hearing loss, uh, and anybody who has or knows someone knows that it is probably. I would put them at number one as far as senses go. You know, the most important senses because it can have not only uh, you know just the, the the, the social aspect of it, but just the, the quality of life and, uh, you know, the cognitive, um, you know, capabilities of a person get affected depending on how well uh, they can hear. So, but, yeah, so, so there's a lot of research in the hearing field, you know, so I'm not going to have specific examples, but just to kind of summarize in one slide, now, vibrometers are used, you know, for, you know, for hearing impaired, they use either hearing aids or implantable devices. So we do a lot of testing at the transducer level or even at, um, at research level, at fundamental research, where we measure. So if you look at the figure on the right, we measure as the sound is coming in, it's first hitting the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. From there, it goes to the middle ear. 
where there are three bones called the middle ear ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and then the cochlea, and then the optical nerve from here. So the 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 research uh, researchers would look at uh, what's one of the metric is called METF, middle ear transfer function, which is basically the ratio or the frequency response function between the measurement at the tympanic membrane. So that's where the sound is coming in. And uh, this here, which is called the oval window where the stapes foot plate connects to the inner ear or the cochlea. So that tells how good the transmission characteristics is through this mechanical structure. So fun fact, uh, uh, stapes is the smallest bone in the human body. So this is a very fundamental research, but it's been Polytech and has been part of this for 30, 40 years now, uh, very integral in where um, uh, hearing research is. Uh, one of the emerging topics is definitely blast exposure um, or impact. So there are many cases, whether it's uh, sports or um, you know military applications where um, someone gets exposed to a blast and you know what is that doing to the hearing and how can we do a better job at protecting the hearing? How can we design better ear protection or restorative devices? So fascinating field. Um, definitely reach out if you have any questions on this. Uh, sticking on the biomedical side of things, uh, insect communication. There's a lot of stuff here and um, I'm going to go through uh, each of these uh, pictures here. But um, I read somewhere that there are more than 200,000 species uh, that communicate using vibrations, some kind of tapping or noise or vibration, whether it's on a branch or by their wings and all kinds of or applications where vibrations is used as a means of communication, um, whether it's to... Um, let others know around them that, uh, hey, there is uh, some danger here or for, for mating rituals, all kinds of applications. So electroception in bumblebees, communication mechanism in spiders, you know, hearing pathways in frogs. Um, uh, caterp this is an interesting one on the top. You see a caterpillar munching on a, on a leaf and it's a fascinating work by uh, uh, a lot of researchers. Um, but uh, you know, Professor uh, Heidi Apple at uh, University of Toledo does some of this as well, where uh, the plant reacts uh, when someone's trying to eat it by releasing some chemicals uh, uh, to in response to this. So we have done some measurements to measure the the sound that the the caterpillar is making uh, while it's munching on this. This measurement on the right is on a spider web. Uh, here, the study was to see the resiliency and the strength or study the strength of this spider web by this particular paper was by Professor Navin Kumar at IIT uh, in uh, Ropur, India, where they are trying to measure the damping of these spider webs and what makes them so resilient. Um, this particular uh, measurement is using one of our single point vibrometers on the left here measuring on a plant. And this is the work by Casey uh, Fowler-Finn. She's at uh, St. Louis University. Um, similar work by Professor Rex uh, Cocroft at University of uh, Missouri, Columbia, where he's studying uh, the, the mating behavior and the communication protocol between tree hoppers. So that's what these little uh, ones are here. The one on the uh, right here is, is a female and the one on the left is a male uh, tree hopper. Um, and finally, um, frogs, uh, frogs, all about frogs. And that's the work uh, by Professor Norman Lee at uh, St. Olaf University. And he's uh, uh, studying uh, what uh, he defines it as a uh, frog's answer to uh, dealing with the cocktail party problem. Uh, frogs trying to call a certain other frog, but there's so much noise. Uh, how does uh, it uh, hear or get the message through? So it has um, many ways to do it, and uh, it, it does this lung inflation thing, which creates almost like a, a filter. Uh, it it kind of attenuates certain frequencies, and so it figures out a way by um, just you know uh, in, inflation and deflation of its uh, lungs uh, to uh, 
to sort of gauge and attenuate the frequencies that are not of interest so it can communicate more directly even in a noisy pond with a, a, a you know the, the same species of, of frogs and here so we had done some studies measuring on tympanic membranes which are actually external in cases of frogs uh, using our vibrometer so the vibrometer again is is a game changer in this particular case because the vibration levels are so small and mass loading is out of question so you absolutely need that super small spot size um, the ability to measure very very small vibrations and um, uh, a broad frequency range as well so Fascinating work, uh, ongoing since decades now, but again, not very well known. So, which is why it uh, would fall under exotic as well. So, um, that was that was pretty cool. A uh, couple more uh, to go. Elephants. I had an elephant on the front slide, so we got to talk about elephants. Um, again, communication. This was a very uh, interesting application because, uh, you know. The goal was to, of course, understand how the elephants communicate. How are they talking with each other? Who is calling the shots? You know, so to be able to understand, uh, looking at their rumble response, one can tell, you know, how, you know, who is the boss, and you know, who who are who is the leader who are following uh, following them, and um, and understanding that kind of gives an idea about the the community itself. Uh, or a family of uh, these uh, elephants. Um, again, the, the, what made this application um, uh, interesting and challenging is because the, the, the target is moving. The target's moving quite a bit. So um, our engineer definitely had a fun time kind of following, you know, uh, using the tripod. But fortunately, the system we used, of course, it doesn't require any surface preparation. We cannot be doing any surface prep on these animals. But also uh, with the changing standoff distance to be able to still measure whether the beam is perfectly focused or not and uh, still being able to get uh, meaningful data. That was the interesting part. So, yep, uh, it's a nice publication uh, by Caitlin at Stanford on this. Uh, if you want to check it out. Um, you're probably fatigued by now. So let's talk fatigue. Um, Fatigue is a, an interesting application again. Uh, I won't put it under exotic, but definitely a different take on vibrometry. So fatigue, what is, I mean, you know, so, uh, a lot of materials, pretty much all materials, especially in, in you know, medical, automotive, uh, or aerospace fields, they uh, undergo a fatigue test to determine its strength and durability, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, how is it going to take the load? Is it going to take the number of cycles? So there are ASTM standards defined to run these fatigue tests. And the fatigue tests are defined by a uh, certain amount of force or certain amount of strain for a given number of cycles. It used to be 1 million cycles and 10 million cycles, which is high cycle fatigue. And now people are talking about 1 billion cycles. So why is this that, uh, you know, where, where does vibrometry come into picture? Why, you know, why can't you just use a strain gauge, you know, or, you know, so, uh, or what, what's wrong with what we have, right? So, uh, so the high cycle fatigue is 10 to seven, and then, you know, we get into very high cycle fatigue, which is a billion cycles. If we run it at 10, 100 hertz, it takes quite a bit of time. Um, now to reduce the time, one way to reduce the time is to increase the frequency. Now, when you increase the frequency, first of all, a lot of uh, strain gauges and, and uh, uh, contact transducers reach its limit in terms of maximum frequency. Secondly, you also have to deal with the high temperatures. So you have to do some temperature management as well. So if you can make the same strain measurements at high frequencies, you get the best of both worlds. You reduce the amount of time while not having to worry about contact transducers mounted on your sample. So this is a, what's called a dog bone sample, which is a very standard configuration of sample used for these fatigue testing. Um, the approach we came up with is uh, using a standard vibrometer, one of our QTEC vibrometers, in a very specific configuration. So we use four of these single point vibrometers, and then we measure in-plane components at two points, and we have algorithms that specifically and very accurately measure the distance between these two points as well. 
So if you know the distance, which is the L, and if you know how much these two points are moving in the in-plane direction, you can calculate delta L, and now you can calculate strain. Sounds easy, but there's a lot of image processing and uh, uh, dealing with uh, you know super high signal to noise ratio required, especially at these high frequencies where the amplitude is going to be very small. So that's where the the multipath uh, QTech uh, technology comes into picture, where uh, we get that super high signal to noise ratio required to make these uh, in plane measurements. So this is definitely up and coming field, and um, um, especially with these. Uh, requirements on the industry for doing very high cycle fatigue testing vhcf which goes to a billion cycles so this is another uh, you know i guess out of the box use of uh, vibrometers uh, uh, in in uh, strain testing um, one last slide on the strain testing again a lot of uh, plots here but yeah these are the raw first four are the raw data sets then we do the processing and do the in-plane. I would say the most important is the last one here, which is a comparison between the SGs, the strain gauge data, which is the, the squiggly lines here, and then the blue being the what came out of the vibrometer. So yeah, one is you know more noisy than the other, but overall you can see that the amplitudes are, are are very much comparable. Uh, it's more of a proof of concept to show that yes. Uh, this technique works, and yes, it works just as well or much or better than uh, the, the status quo. So that is the goal here. Uh, I'll end with this last application. Um, once again, absolutely falls under both interesting and exotic, in my opinion. Um, this is uh, with courtesy from Oxford Instruments. Um, they are uh, a premier uh, atomic force microscope uh, manufacturers, been around for a long, long time, used to be called Asylum Research before Oxford, Oxford Instruments. Um, they offer a vibrometer, they offer an AFM that is based on uh, using a vibrometer to measure the beam deflection or the tip deflection, uh, the tip being the, the, the heart uh, and the soul of these AFMs, of course. Um, they recently published a, an application note as well, talking about PFM, the PSO response force microscopy, and why they're, um, you know, the, the vibrometer-based uh, version becomes even more important because as opposed to the conventional technique, the way they measure the tip deflection is by what's called an OBD or optical beam deflection method, um, where it's measuring the the angle, and then from angle, it's kind of you know getting to deflection. Whereas with a vibrometer, you are measuring the tip deflection directly, so there is no ambiguity in the data. There is no um, chance of the flexural modes showing up in the data, uh, and you can be a lot more precise in direct measurements. And the noise floor is orders of magnitude lower than with a conventional AFM. So. Uh, some groundbreaking work in this field and of course it has applications in the you know the 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 piezo constant calculations imaging techniques and and all kinds of uh, applications in the the ferro you know electric world and and imaging as well so um this would be the last one for today um so we went from Elephants to frogs to dinosaurs to um, haptics metamaterials to AFMs and, and and strain testers and a lot more. So hopefully this gives you a flavor of something different, something um, something unique, uh, something you haven't heard before. I hope at least one of the slides uh, resonated uh, with uh, with you today. Thank you.